The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, I think we're online. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Marwan Hussain. I'm a researcher at UITP, MENA CTE office here in Dubai. I will be gladly moderating today's uh, session and webinar. Today's session and webinar will be titled, How Has COVID-19 Changed the Life of Informal Bus Operators and Authorities? And this is the first webinar of a group of three webinars of a series. And uh, yeah, today we have a lot of speakers that I would like to introduce. So I'm not gonna speak a lot, but um, we're gonna have experiences. We're gonna listen to experiences from Turkey and from Africa, from Senegal, from Egypt. And uh, we'll be also happy to hear your questions. Just something uh, very quickly on the logistics. We will be, the webinar will be 90 minutes. And on your screen, you will find on your right, so our right hand side, a control panel in which you'll find the chat tab. Write your questions there. And after each speaker will be done with his or her presentation, I'll be glad to uh, uh, ask them and we'll try and answer as many uh, questions as possible. So, um, yeah, I think this is it. Uh, I'll uh, very quickly uh, leave the floor to our uh, chair of the informal transport committee, Mr. Faisullah Gundugdu. He is the manager director of uh, Kayseri Transport Company. And um, yeah, I leave the floor to him for his welcome. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, Faisullah, the much. floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marwan. Uh, I would, first of all, I would like to welcome all of our uh, attendees to the on board. Uh, good, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. So uh, today we are going to talk about how uh, coronavirus affects the public transport sector and especially informal. So if you remember, uh, our working group has been created in the. Uh, UITB submit in Stockholm last year. Then actually we were going to have a meeting in the uh, within the UITB MENA Congress April, April in this year. I think there is some echo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, due to the coronavirus, so uh, we are together now on a, a series of the webinars. Uh, so we later in this month and the coming month, we are going to have one more, uh, two more uh, seminar. My colleagues uh, later, uh, they are going to give some more information. Uh, let us come to the uh, uh, topic back. We all know that uh, COVID outbreak started end of last year, 2019, and uh, it is affected all over the world. Many sectors uh, affected, especially public transport sectors also, one of the main sector that uh, affected too much. Shops, schools are closed. Uh, more than 4 billion of people uh, put in quarantine and isolated uh, from the daily life. Uh, and also uh, the, the effect of uh, on public transport is very huge. Number of passengers almost 90% decreased around the world. There are some maybe different numbers, but especially uh, we can say that uh, generally we can say that night person uh, dropped from the normal uh, period, pre-COVID period. But uh, our personnel, our personnel, public transport personnel continue to work under very risky condition. Uh, we have to thank them all uh, beside uh, healthcare person. Uh, because they work under uh, very risky condition. Uh, we have seen in this period that public transport is very critical service that must continue to serve uh, at least for essential workers, workers for healthcare and others. If uh, public transport stops in a city, it means that the city uh, stop and economy of the city also stop. Again, uh, it is important to state once more that in many of our cities, transportation service is given by mostly by informal sector 
uh, around 80-90%. For example, let me give the figures from the Kayseri. 60% uh, of the public transport service is given by the uh, informal one, uh, individual uh, owned public transport. So therefore, informal public transport sector plays very important role in those cities. In some cases, there are no choice other than informal one. There is no formal uh, public transport in those cities. During coronavirus outbreaks, some issues become very important for health, for safety of our passenger and driver and worker. To stop spreading, uh, virus additional major, uh, measures have been taken, such as cleaning, disinfection of the vehicles, and we put hand sanitizer on the vehicles and at the stations. Uh, you can easily notice that this kind of measures uh, all affects the finance and sustainability of the sector. More cleaning, it means that more, uh, more cleaning and more disinfections ad creates additional cost and uh, social distance directly affect the cost and the revenue of the public transport. In many city cities, uh, due to social distance, capacity of the vehicles are limited to 25% of the normal condition. For example, in normal case, we carry uh, almost 100 passenger in a uh, regular one regular bus, but uh, within the uh, coronavirus, so we uh, could carry uh, not uh, more than 25 uh, passenger. Operators could not be able to adopt the service level accordingly because of the social distance. The revenue also dropped accordingly 90%, but uh, we couldn't adjust the service level just we can uh, decrease the service level up to 30 or 40 percent because of the social distance. So if we uh, sum, two, uh, sum all them up, we see two uh, important topics that affect uh, public informal public transport or public transport sector. One is safety and the other sustainability of the system. Uh, remember from the last meetings or uh, and discussion, these two subjects are the subject that informal sectors are already weak. Maybe later we are going to uh, talk about the externalities and vulnerabilities of the uh, informal sector. But these are the uh, uh, safety and sustainability. These are the uh, two big side of the informal one. In terms of finance, Informal sector is not resistance because revenue directly depends on uh, passenger number, depends on the revenue. Since it is dropped, so revenue dropped by same amount, so that informal sector are suffering too much about the revenue drop. In terms of safety, informal sector is also very weak because there is not enough control and check to be sure that uh, safety is assured. Uh, since sector is not formalized also, they are very dispersed around the city and they don't have depot and cleaning facilities. Uh, after service, service uh, at night, driver takes their bus to home and they finish work at night. Uh, they don't be able to clean and disinfect the, uh, their bus, their vehicles. Uh, they don't have depot or facilities to do cleaning and dis disinfection correctly unless uh, municipalities or authorities make the clean and disinfection for them. Another issue that informal sector could not control themselves because there is no uh, formalized institutional structure. There is no self-control mechanism between uh, or among them. We have to control them every time. As I said, informal uh, sector, we have two main problems. One is sustainability, the other is uh, safety. So what we have to do, we have to find uh, solution for them. We have to find other source for uh, finance, uh, which does depends on the revenues. There are uh, these are very big challenge for the sectors. They always ask for financial uh, su support and help. Under this hard condition, in Turkey, for example, informal sectors are still running. They are giving service to our people, our passenger, uh, and also what is the situation around the world? We are going to learn. Uh, what is good for us? We are not alone around the world. We are not alone. We have the UITP and UITP informal uh, public transport group and other stakeholders, World Bank, SSATP, then we, that we can share ideas, good examples and challenges. 
and learn from each other. And there are UITP teams also, they are supporting us. Uh, for, uh, for the people in, in this sector, as uh, all our colleague, colleague here attending the webinar, our mission is to get gather more people from the sector, to collect more people, uh, and we need to reach more people from the sector to share their pains, their difficulties, and find solution together. We have to make visible also public, we have to make public sector uh, visible to everyone that public sector plays very important role in the city life. The COVID period showed that how difficult to serve under this condition for uh, even uh, for authorities and all operators. I would like to thank uh, all of you to join our webinar and uh, I would like to thank all UITP team that organized this webinar. Thank you very much and hope to see you uh, again in the uh, next uh, uh, during the, uh, these sessions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Faizullah, for your uh, strong words, strong message. I think really, yeah, you're not alone is a very strong message that all of us need to hear right now. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, I'll just also give the floor really quickly to Mr. Mustafa bin Muhammad, the lead transport economist and the acting program manager at the Sub-Saharan African Transport Program at the World Bank. Mr. Mustafa. Thank you, uh, Marwan, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Uh, maybe uh, a quick word about SSATP for uh, those of you who don't know the program. is a, a Sub-Saharan African Transport Program. It's a, a multi-donor trust fund that is uh, administered and managed by the World Bank. Uh, SSATP has been uh, on the land since 1987, and the main objective is to facilitate uh, transport policy in, in a member uh, countries. Uh, at the moment, we have 42 African countries that are a member, and uh, we have an executive committee. And uh, as you may know, the UITP is the uh, a member of this executive uh, committee representing the private sector. Um, SSATP is about to launch its uh, fourth development plan that will span uh, over a period uh, starting next year, 2021 to 2025. Um, and urban mobility uh, is one of uh, the main uh, priority uh, direction of this development plan. Uh, and um, as uh, this COVID-19 crisis, uh, uh, it showed that um, the bus informal sector uh, is a key uh, sector. Uh, it provides a lifeline to millions of people uh, uh, as job, as uh, bus drivers, or uh, as simply users. Uh, and, and the informal sector um, came to fill this gap uh, that was left by the formal sector. And that's from the decades. So it's here to stay, and we have to uh, work uh, around this. So, reforming the informal sector will be one of the main activities or area of this uh, urban mobility pillar of SSATP. And I hope we'll have the opportunity to, to discuss and, and hopefully share some, some results of this um, challenging but exciting agenda. So I, I will just stop here because we have uh, many uh, many presentations. Maybe I could uh, I could uh, come back with some comments once once uh, we listen to our uh, participants and presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mustafa, for your words. Um, okay, and now uh, yeah, Emmanuel, I hand the floor to you. 
Thank you, Marwan. So, uh, hello everyone. Really happy uh, to welcome you on board this uh, this uh, webinar, this first webinar uh, about informal transport, as it has been uh, uh, stressed and presented uh, previously by previous speakers. Um, as has been underlined uh, by Mr. Fizula, the chairman of the UITP Informal Transport Platform. Uh, <clears throat> the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has had significant impact uh, on public transport worldwide, and particularly on the informal transport sector. Um, regarding COVID-19, uh, let me just uh, inform you that UITP has been very much involved in providing uh, up-to-date and cutting-edge information on the uh, on the situation. A specific uh, dedicated task force has been set up to provide information to members. Uh, and of course, as an international association for public transport, we are more than happy to welcome you to present, discuss, and uh, exchange about your experience. And we're really happy to also listen to your questions. Today, we have the chance to get on board high-level speakers from various parts of the world, and uh, in particular from Turkey and, and Africa. Uh, let me thank uh, our colleagues from SSATP uh, who are part of this project of uh, the three webinars. We're really happy to cooperate uh, with you. We are, of course, happy to welcome a large audience. Uh, and maybe uh, to get to know you a little more, we'd be happy uh, if you could participate in a survey to identify the, the continent you are uh, coming from and you are listening us from. Coming back to uh, our subject, we all know that uh, informal transport plays a major role in the urban life of many cities from the MENA region to Africa, Asia, Latin America, etc. In moving around many dwellers and uh, the significance of this industry and uh, also the uh, recent evolution of the global situation regarding the pandemic offer uh, an opportunity, a new opportunity, let's say to step back a little bit and discuss a variety of relevant issues and challenges. This is why, and it has been mentioned by Marwan uh, and by Mr. Fezula, uh, we are organizing a series of uh, three webinars. So this one in August, the very last day of August, one in September and in October 2020. Um, so the, the, the webinars follow a meeting that uh, UITP organized on the 13th of May 2020. Uh, at the time, we were all in the midst of the pandemic um, and we were facing the first wave of the pandemic. With this series of three webinars, we'd like to step back a little bit and reflect on uh, three types of topics. So this very first webinar deals about the current situation and addresses the following question. How has COVID-19 changed the life of small individual bus operators and authorities? We'll probably have also, uh, in the course of this session, a little discussion about what we're talking about, how could we define what is our definition, understanding, catch of informal transport. Then the topic of informal transport also involves, of course, uh, a, key, a key issue, which is the issue of governance. Therefore, the second webinar shall deal with the key conditions of success to formalize informal transport and set up a transport authority. This is the second webinar that will take place in September. Informal transport operators and authorities have, during this period, developed high agility. And this agility and, uh, results in many solutions which are based on technology. And the third webinar will deal with this question, and particularly with how innovations and new solutions have allowed uh, operators and sometimes also authorities to adapt to the new normal. Detailed information shall be provided soon uh, on the coming webinars, and that's about it for me. Thank you for your attention. I leave the floor to Marwan. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you so much for the great overview. I think this is a very exciting effort, and I'm very excited to hear from all of you today. Um, so, our basically our goal today is to present what's been happening in the informal transport around the world uh, in the COVID-19 context and hearing from operators and authorities um, their point of view. Today, we're focusing basically on three questions, right? So we're gonna look at how has COVID-19 impacted the businesses, finances? What are the measures undertaken to improve the situation? And what do we or they or you expect 
from government uh, from governments right so yeah um we have a lot of speakers today so i'm gonna move on and give the floor to the speakers we have a recorded keynote speech from Mr. Erkan Soydash, the president of TUHOP, the Union of Public Private Bosses in Turkey, who could not be with us today. So uh, I think we will, we can play this. Uh, Arthur, are we ready? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, we can maybe present all the speakers and then, uh, and then play the, okay. the video. Let me prepare it quickly. Okay okay great so yeah today basically we like i said before we have a very international and rich uh, speaker list uh, we have mr faizula gundugdu as i mentioned as uh, before managing director of kasseri transport company from turkey we have mr tierno brahim Ao, managing director of dakar urban transport council in Setud in senegal we have mr mohammed hegezi director of uh, transport for cairo which is a consultancy or research consultancy i'll leave him to present himself as well and mrs fatima arroyo arroyo senior urban transport specialist at the sub-saharan african transport program at the world bank and um, yeah as i mentioned before we also had with us uh, uh, should have had with us mr erkan soydash but he was kind enough to record his uh, speech we will show this to you very shortly kindly close your webcams and mute your mics thank you
Okay, thank you, Arthur. And uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Erkan. I think also very strong words and powerful message. Uh, Mr. Erkan is the true representation of the sector. It was very important for us to hear him out and give him the floor to see what uh, he has to say. So we have not just the same institutions that, uh, that speak on the topic, but truly representation from the sector. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I will now give the floor to Mr. Faizullah Gundogdu, Managing Director of Kayseri Transport Company, also in Turkey, to share with us what has been happening in Turkey and give us a better view on how COVID-19 has impacted the transport operations there. Mr. Faizullah, the floor is yours. I think now we can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yes, yeah, okay. Thank you very much again. So, uh, in my presentation, I am going to talk about the challenges and opportunities for, for the informal public sector in Turkey. First of all, I am going to talk about the problem and the situation of and the, the, my presentation I'm going to talk about uh, what are the solutions and what are the opportunities that we have to care on that so first of all uh, I'm uh, going to put uh, uh, brief information so in first case in Turkey it has been seen in March 11 then uh, we are going to have some preventive measures. And uh, it is important that the uh, decision maker, uh, mayors, um, pre presidents, etc., always telling people not to use public transport. Now, in the future, maybe we are going to face the problem of telling not to use public transport uh, now. Then we start disinfection and cleaning and sanitary device, etc., etc. And also we have the limitation that I have already talked about that. But uh, the uh, good things for public transport, uh, transport sector, the service not interrupted in Turkey. And uh, it, at la the later phase, uh, wearing masks become compulsory in public transport. If you uh, get on the bus, you have to wear the mask or to get on the train, you have to wear the mask. But uh, here, uh, you know, as I in the previous uh, speech, I have talked about uh, the number of passenger drop and service level drop, limited capacity. But now uh, we are in the uh, new normal phase. Started in started in June, so so the capacity of the vehicle, no more 25 percent, almost uh, about 50 to 60 percent now. Uh, as I said in previous my speech, in general, informal transport uh, has big share, six to, to eight percent. If you add uh, school bus and company bus together, maybe in some cities in Turkey, it is almost 90 percent. And what is the big challenge for them? The revenue depends on the number of passengers. So we have net cost contract model with the uh, individual or informal sectors. Uh, with the municipality, with the authorities. So the big challenge here is the finance or sustainability of the sectors. It is the big challenge. But uh, in this year, government, public transport sector uh, supported by the government by implementing some special tax regime. Uh, in this year, January 2020, 2020 income tax tax reduced to one percent from almost 25 percent. VAT reduced uh, to one percent from the 18 percent. All the tax and loan payments postponed by six months. Uh, low changes to let municipality to, uh, to support support public transport to subsidize the individual ones. But as Mr. Erjan says in uh, his speech, so uh, since there is. I mean, uh, uh, 
municipalities income also depends on the uh, collective tax around the, uh, Turkey. If the tax uh, collective tax uh, tax are reduced, so uh, the uh, revenue of the municipality is also reduced by almost 40 to 50 percent. That's why uh, municipality municipalities couldn't be able to support support the public transport sector. Uh, some of the municipalities uh, supporting, but uh, most of them uh, could not be able to support. So uh, since one uh, one of the critical things also is that the sector uh, sector is not uh, formalized. There is no no company structure. Operators also could not benefit some of uh, other support packages in terms of short term work, etc. So let us come to the operational data. I am not going to talk too much on this. Uh, you know, you can see maybe later we are going to distribute this uh, presentation. You can have a look from there. Also, these are the data from the uh, 11 cities that there is a, a LRT system or metro system there. Istanbul, Ankara, uh, Izmir, very, uh, I mean, high density cities. So you can have a look to uh, real uh, figures that the till now if you compare march and july we are still 50 percent of the uh, passenger of the uh, pre-covid period so we lost 50 percent of the passenger during the uh, covid 19. so if you have a look to kayseri data operational data you can see on the left side uh, pre-covid period uh, in the beginning of march we uh, all transport mode together bus lrt and uh, together we carry more than uh, almost uh, 450,000 passengers, but nowadays it is less than 250,000. So you can see the uh, number of drop. And uh, between this period, you can see uh, the variation of the number of passengers. So actually we, uh, we dropped, sometimes there, there was a curfew. So we, other than uh, healthcare people, we didn't uh, get the passenger. So you can see the drops uh, during the uh, COVID period. So this graph shows uh, how the revenue also dropped. You can see that according to the number of, uh, uh, according to the passenger drop, revenue also dropped down to 10%. Now we are in a uh, in a level that we are uh, our revenue uh, 45 to 80 percent, 50 percent of the uh, pre-COVID period. So this is the uh, figures for the individual sectors. In Kaiser, we have individual sectors. Uh, I can say that we have 600 bus and uh, 200, uh, 600 bus, 400 of them is belongs to individual operators. So you can see the variation of the sector fleet kilometers. Now it is uh, decreased to, uh, I mean, 55,000 but it was already if, uh, before COVID, it was 120,000 or something like that. So the, this is the daily trips, uh, daily trips uh, figures. So you can see uh, that now uh, daily trip becomes 81% of the uh, normal, uh, normal uh, time, normal period before the COVID. So the, we, our bus, the bus belongs to our company. Uh, if you see the uh, kilometer uh, figures, so we are now in this 63 uh, of the normal conditions. In terms of daily trip, so we are uh, 58 to the normal uh, normal period before COVID. So uh, you can have a look at uh, tram line data. Actually, we uh, we. Uh, reach the pre-COVID period. Current situation of the kilometer number of kilometers is uh, almost 90, uh, 96 percent of the normal uh, period. So the, the number of trip is again uh, zero, uh, 82 percent, but, but uh, the different difference uh, comes from that uh, pre-COVID period we stopped operation at night, uh, late night, uh, 12 o'clock, but now. Uh, in the post-COVID period, we stop operation at 11 uh, o'clock at night. That's why the trip number is uh, less a little bit. So as uh, Mr. Erjan uh, says that actually explained the situation in a very well, and uh, the individual operators 
asking always uh, to have more more uh, privilege and uh, to not to pay tax for fuel etc but they are as he said they are in a very difficult situation they are bankrupting and not able to buy the fuel but uh, when we discuss together i can say that uh, to get some more privilege on fuel or not uh, or some other uh, cost uh, items not to solve our programs our problems for the individual operators for sustainable public transport uh, we have to take uh, some other solution uh, in place some other solution must be in place, in place uh, to solve uh, the uh, finance or sustainability problems so uh, what are the challenges first of all we have the finance we have the finance problem uh, we have to find alternative financing tools so since the revenue just uh, comes from the number of passengers if the number of passengers uh, drop down due to the virus and some other reason etc so uh, we will have finance pro problem again so we have to find another way of financing public transport uh, system uh, and also uh, what mr arjan mentioned in his speech also we have some uh, groups uh, privileged group that have right to have free travel so uh, for example uh, older people uh, uh, can travel freely uh, can use all all modes of public transport and the percentage of that uh, groups is uh, starting from 15 percent for example in kaiser we have 15 percent free travel by uh, older people uh, older than people 65 years you know uh, but in some cities it the rate is uh, 40 to 50 percent for example in cities alanya izmir some uh, cities that uh, there is a cost with the sea uh, older people live there and uh, their rate of uh, using public transport is too high so it affects the income of the info, uh, individual sectors so the, we have another problem to gain back the trust of the public, people to use public transport. So we have to communicate uh, with, the, uh, with our uh, older passenger that we are uh, taking the preventive measures uh, to make public transport safe. And other problems and other challenges we are facing now, uh, managing the crowd, managing the travel demand. So see, since we have uh, limited capacity, 50 percent so we have to differentiate daily start time of the school industry office etc uh, to uh, to wider the uh, peak hours so this is the challenge for us uh, informal sectors and uh, formal sectors together and with limited capacity if the uh, capacity limitation are in place for the future due to the safe distance or uh, due to the uh, distribu not distrib distributing the virus, uh, we are going to need more vehicles to carry the same, same amount of uh, passengers. So what are the opp opportunities we can, I can talk a little bit on that. So we have seen that uh, public, the info, individual public transport model or informal, pu informal public transport model will not go in this way. So since the revenue depends on the uh, number of passengers if there is a drop on the passenger side so it will affect the system so uh, we can say that public transport system has to be reformed uh, mr mustafa i think talk about the reformation so it is very important we have i, we, I can share some figures you know uh, we have done some uh, transform uh, inter trans, uh, transfer, transferring the transferring point between the modes so we can gain uh, millions of kilometers but uh, re reforming the public transport network so there is a possibility to increase the efficiency of the system uh, and we can say that this is indirect finance of the public transport so public transport have, has to be formalized uh, formalized because since there is no formalization they don't have uh, to use chance of scale economy and other benefits as i said for example short-term work etc 
Uh, after that, we can change the contract model. If uh, the two item is not uh, uh, completed, we, we, we will have difficulty to change the uh, contract model. Now the contract model is the uh, net cost model. To go to gross cost with uh, base of high, uh, high quality of service, so we need to uh, change the contract model. But before that, we have to be reform the public transport informal sector, and we have to formalize them. So these are the opportunities. Uh, now uh, we have chance to make uh, this kind of uh, reformation because uh, uh, all decision makers, all people, mayors, etc., have seen that this sector is very uh, public transport is very crucial, is very vital sector, but the individual uh, operators are very weak according to the, uh, any disturbances in the finance, etc. So these are the uh, opportunities that I can say. This is the end of my question. Maybe later, if you have any question, I can answer. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Faizula. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, yeah, I think that a lot of uh, a lot of countries share what's been happening. I think you gave us a really, really nice uh, overview. The questions are open. Please, um, for anyone that would like to ask a question, on the screen on your right hand side, you will see a chat box. Kindly type your question into that chat box, and we'll make sure to answer it. So maybe I can give a minute. Um, If there is no maybe end of uh, presentations. Okay, also I, I answer, think if there, there, is, there is one. So as far for uh, yeah, as far as recovery is concerned, uh, it looks like the informal sector is doing better than the formal sector. How can we explain this trend? So uh, you know, yeah, actually, in uh, Kayseri, we uh, we have a different uh, contract model. We have individual operators for. I am talking about the Kayseri, okay? Uh, in Kayseri, yes. we have diff different uh, contract model. We have individual operators, but uh, starting from 2017, we changed the contract model to the uh, gross cost model. So uh, during this period, actually, we have the bus, we have the LRT, so we have uh, two. Uh, I mean, to support individual operators, operators we are giving uh, more uh, chance to make more trips to them. The figures uh, coming from that. So we are giving chance to, uh, to them to earn more money because we are uh, using some benefits of short term work. Our uh, half of the drivers uh, at home and getting money from the government. That's why we are using this chance. Uh, to give more uh, jobs to the individual sector. sector. So they are they're doing more kilometers, more trip, and they are getting more money. Uh, that's why the uh, difference coming from that. Okay, and the uh, second one is that you have underlined the contradiction. Um, better protection, but the message is to use less public transport. How have you dealt with that to increase trust? Yeah, actually, this is our problem after COVID, COVID period. So since uh, all the decision maker, all the politicians are telling the people not to use public transport. So it is very difficult later we are going to face this problem. But what we can do to show the people that we are doing the preventive measure, we are doing the uh, disinfection after the service, we are doing cleaning, etc., everything properly, that the public transport is safe, they, they are going to come to use the public transport. But in Turkey, there is uh, like this, but as, as I've seen from the, uh, I mean, research from the Europe, from the east, uh, east part of the world, from the Japan, uh, the spread of uh, coronavirus, rate of spread uh, from the coronavirus in the public transport is very low. So we have to explain decision maker that the uh, public transport uh, vehicles is not the uh, place that uh, spreading the coronavirus that there there are some other place that uh, spreads much more than the public transport so we are going to explain uh, our passenger uh, public transport is safe 
since they are uh, using their mask, it is compulsory after using the mask, so it is safe place like others. We have, okay. we have to insist on this. Yeah, I think that's very important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's very important to restore confidence. This is, I think, the vital, the most vital component for transport uh, on the way on its, on its recovery. One just last swift question is how can contracts with operators strengthen uh, them, like the operators? How can contracts improve the situation of them? Contract or content? I, I, I didn't understand. Contracts, like the contracts with the operators, how could they yeah. improve the situation of uh, the so, operators uh, moving on? Yeah, as I said, uh, we have changed the contract model in 2017 uh, in terms of uh, based on uh, service quality level. So we changed the contract type. Actually, it was the uh, net cost uh, and depends on the uh, passenger revenue. We changed at that time. Uh, with, we have signed uh, in, we have signed a contract with the uh, association of the uh, bus uh, owners here, and each. Uh, uh, bus owner uh, committed that they uh, accept all the uh, circumstances of the uh, contract. So since then we are uh, paying them according to the number of kilometers. That's why the uh, individual operators in Kayseri, they are very lucky. They don't affect uh, too much like, uh, like other cities in Turkey. So we have changed the contract model based on uh, customer uh, service customer satisfaction and uh, quality of service. Okay. Okay, that's great to hear. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fazula. I think that is it. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very strong and powerful. Um, okay, before moving on, just maybe quickly, Arthur, are you with us? Can you maybe show us the results of the survey that we've uh, asked? Yes, you should see it now on the screen. Okay, great. So yeah, this is the result of the survey that we've posted earlier. We have a very strong representation from Europe, as we can see, uh, then followed by a very strong African audience as well, as well as then Asia, and then followed by America. Very interesting. That is very interesting. Okay, so moving on to our second presentation of the day uh, from um, Mr. Tierno Brahim Au. He will shed light on the experience from Africa, from Senegal. Uh, he will uh, give us the point of view of a transport authority, uh, as he is the managing director of, a Dakar, uh, of the Dakar Urban Transport uh, Council, L'Institut. And um, yeah, I think I'll give you the floor so we don't run out of time. Mr. Tierno, the floor is yours. Please, uh, if you could unmute your microphone, we cannot hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, I'm uh, very happy to be with you. Um, so uh, first of all, I would like to, to greet everyone and thank you ITP, the World Bank, and uh, SSATP uh, for the opportunity to share uh, Senegal COVID-19 uh, management experience. Um, Yes. It's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, how COVID-19 has impacted the business and the uh, finance of uh, small operators? Uh, before getting into the heart of the issue, um, I would like to share some of the contextual elements uh, that set the framework for mobility in Dakar. Uh, Dakar, the capital of Senegal, concentrates 50% uh, of the urban population in less than 1% of 
the national territory. We estimate that the population will be doubled in 2040 to reach uh, 7 million population, uh, 7 million inhabitants. When we look about motorization and the uh, use of uh, public transportation, we see uh, that daily, first, we have 7.2 million trips. Um, and uh, for this trip, 70% uh, uh, are due by walking. And we have 80% motorized trip done by public transit. This is a very important indicator for the, uh, uh, the, the, the next step I would uh, share with you. CETRID uh, is the first public transport organization authority in Africa. We are created in 1997, uh, and we are engaged in major urban tech transportation modernizing program since 2005. Uh, uh, this program uh, permits us to reduce the proportion of informal public transportation to 40% today. Uh, we are now working on the last phase of this program, is the introduction of mass transit. Uh, I would say uh, regional express train and the RT project uh, we built with the World Bank and European Investment Bank. And also we work in combination with a public transport system overall uh, restructuring uh, for, for feeders. Um, when we look about the um, indicators coming from uh, the Ministry of uh, Sanitary, we see that uh, regarding to COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, the first imported case uh, was recorded in Senegal on March second 2020 and uh, the implementation of regularity and sanitary measures earlier on has helped to limit the incidence and the mortality rates of this disease they remain below as you see uh, they remain below the african and global average in senegal In this slide, uh, we can see the high special extension of the coronavirus between April and uh, July uh, 20 and 20 in Senegal. Uh, the map uh, reveals as everywhere else uh, a concentration of contamination case in urban areas. If we take uh, Dakar, the capital of uh, Senegal, uh, Dakar alone represents 72 percent of uh, cases. Look about uh, the impact of uh, coronavirus. The, the major regulatory measure between March and June, um, as my colleagues say in, in Turkey, a state of emergency, partial curfew, uh, adaptation of uh, work hours, uh, closures, and the closure of university and school. Between June and now, we cannot continue uh, softening of uh, restriction. Uh, all passengers must be seated in urban buses with uh, obligatory wearing of uh, masks. Uh, we can say that uh, the impact uh, has been devastating for private operators. We carry out almost they carry out almost 90% of public transportation trips without operating subsidies. The most visible and uh, negative impacts are for operator um, the reduction of revenues by half or even three in some cases. Uh, this, this situation is due to restrictive measures uh, on vehicle capacity. Lighting in, in 
for users, we can see a significant increase in waiting time and thus uh, uh, the hardness of uh, travel. And for the, the state of Senegal, a uh, drop in economic growth for gas from 6.8% to 1.1%. However, it was mentioning the positive effects, uh, if I may put it this way, such as reduction, reduction of uh, negative externalities of transportation and uh, innovation in mobility practice. Uh, for example, carpooling, uh, tourists, reorganization of space, time, and uh, work tours. What are the measures to improve the situation? About the operational adjustment and sanitary measures in the transport sector, the most important are uh, reduction of occupancy by health and seating made mandatory for all passengers. Uh, number of passengers restricted for private vehicles and uh, taxis. Uh, mandatory mask wearing and social distancing. It is global measures here. And uh, disaffection of public transport buses periodically and other infrastructure. Uh, we also uh, forbidden sales activities in the in bus station how about uh, financial support the, to support the urban transportation subsector the government has up for a direct injection of financial resources in addition to general support measures for businesses and households uh, through the first COVID-9 fund. The fund is established to $2 billion. It's this uh, 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 fund is Mr. Tierno, I don't know if you can hear us. I think we have a connection issue. Okay, uh, Mr. Tierno, if you My can dad. hear us, I. Oh, there. Sorry, uh, there has been a connection issue. We've been cut off for the past 10 seconds. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, we have problem of connection, right? Yeah, now you're back. Now it's fine. Okay. So let, let's talk about uh, expectation uh, from the government. Uh, in, in order to provide um, urgent response to the current socioeconomic situation and to build uh, sustainable solutions, the government has set up a resilience and a recovery program. The first uh, proposed fiscal, financial, social, sanitary, and security support measures. And the second one uh, is about acceleration of uh, uh, emerging Senegal plan projects and, uh, and reforms. Uh, here you can see in the picture that we, we work hard for the, the BRT project that we are implementing now. Uh, as I say later with the World Bank and European Analysis Bank. Uh, finally, I, I would like to say that uh, uh, the impact of the pandemic is real and worrying. Uh, the only choice we have is to turn straight into a, an opportunity. Uh, searching for a solution should be uh, to avoid an expensive shift towards individual motorized uh, motor. Thank you for your attention. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to give some answer if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Tiano, for your uh... Very nice presentation. It's, uh, I think, a very 
very interesting to see all the measures you have undertaken to uh, 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 combat COVID. So the questions are open. Let me quickly check the question box. Again, if you have any questions, just write them into the chat box. Um, we have one question just to keep track with time. Um, so during the first wave of the pandemic, um, have there been any opportunities to get in touch with the informal transport operators? And if, how, and on what subject? Um, in fact, permanently we are um, with the operator and uh, informal operator in the process of uh, formalization that uh, CETUT uh, began in 2005, uh, we, we have weekly meetings um, held in CETUT and uh, uh, we, are, uh, we have some program of uh, capacity building, awareness raising. Um, and uh, in this period, uh, we, we, we um, uh, leverage um, this uh, program for uh, um, limit, limited uh, the expansion, expansion of the funding. Um, for the rest, we relied on the police uh, for strict application of uh, uh, measures. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tierno. I think these are the questions we have. Maybe at the end, uh, we can then have each speaker maybe just present the last conclusion or an answer to any question if there is. Thank you, Mr. Tierno, for your presentation. Um, for the next presentation. Thank you I, very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tierno. Thank you. For the next presentation, Mr. Mohammed Hegazi from Egypt, um, uh, and also a very old friend, uh, Director of uh, Transport for Cairo, uh, is going to give us a very nice and short uh, overview of what's been happening in the industry in Egypt and on informal transport as well. So uh, thank you, Mohammed, for being with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, Marwan. Uh, can you confirm seeing my screen? Yes, I do. Ah, fantastic. So uh, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Bonjour à tous. I am coming here today to represent uh, Transport for Cairo. We are a consultancy based in Cairo, Egypt, and we work across Africa. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we are seeing the paratransit sector over the last couple of years, how it's changing, and how COVID-19 is affecting the evolution of the paratransit sector. So to start, a uh, quick brief over the presentation today. I'll give a little bit of background, talking about defining paratransit, what we define as paratransit in our work streams, talking about some key trends and then touching on some of them specifically. I'll talk about two case studies, one from Egypt and the other from Uganda, where we have been doing a big project over the last year. And I'll conclude by trying to take a take over how we are seeing COVID-19 affecting the sector at large and our vision for the sector for the future. So to start by looking at the sector, we see that transit service provision at large all across Africa, even in Egypt, is really dominated by the informal paratransit sector. I'll use the term paratransit to refer to informal transportation from here on. So if we look at breaking the sector into four axes, four dimensions, when we start looking at the market forces, we'll see that Africa has a content of increasing population with rising middle class as incomes start increasing. And associately, the number of trips taken increases in number and distance. This relates to the urban environment, a massive process of urbanization, sprawling cities that are less dense as they grow, is really affecting service provision. And we're also seeing a powerful trend of financialization of paratransit. I'll talk about that one in detail in a bit. If we look at the industry, we're seeing a multitude of new entrants, tech-enabled entrants, 
and we're seeing powerful signs that the sector is undercapitalized as it is and this is where the tech entrants are bringing some massively needed capital and changing the high level of fragmentations by providing some consolidation of service provision chinese vehicles are another noteworthy addition because they're changing the sector economics enabling new business models in some areas and finally the regulatory landscape is evolving and completely changing the rules of the game. So let's start by taking a step back and defining paratransit. What do we look at as paratransit? This is a first graph from an amazing book, An Introduction to Paratransit in Sub-Saharan African Cities. Every data point or reference I use is at the bottom of the presentation, so you can always refer back to that later on. And in this book, they define it across three axes, competition, business formality and service planning and what we can see is that the space the spectrum that covers paratransit is really huge it can cover fully formalized companies and also completely informal one-man operations uh, competition can sometimes regulate it sometimes completely open on the street and the main gap that they identify is on the service planning it's really when you have planned services that we start making the shift from paratransit to formal services and this is where we also see the difference in passenger capacity and the autonomy of the operators to define the service that they provide. It's also another spectrum that we locate paratransit on. What does this look like in practice? So if we sum up paratransit by some main characteristics, on the supply side, we see small fleet owners. Sometimes they're organized, sometimes they're driver owners. And this is the main, main, main driver of the industry it's about employment generation service provision always comes second to employment generation for the paratransit workers they often work according to a target system we call it a landlord system where i rent a car and i have to pay a certain target every day for the rent and the competition takes place on the street as opposed to at the contractual level from a service perspective, often they're fill and go services. I wait until the vehicle is full before I start operating. We did a lot of mapping. We specialize in mapping these informal networks and we find that they really focus on direct service point to point. They never integrate well or provide minimal transfers or with each other. Often they integrate really well with formal rail or BRT services and they're cash dominated and across egypt across africa they take multiple different so forms tuk tuk suzuki's microbuses boda boda motorcycles or even the 29 seater matatus in kenya now we're seeing new entrants coming in the industry is rapidly changing this is a promotional picture from swivel we call them a peak only commuter service operating in cairo it's app based but in reality, they still exhibit highly informal modes of operation. This is a garage in which they park their vehicles during off-peak hours until they can operate at peak hours because this is the segmentation that they do. We see Safe Boda in Uganda, which provides app-driven motorcycle taxi services. And change is happening in fare collection, which is sometimes moving to cashless systems, loyalty programs, bundled tickets, advertising to accommodate the fare box revenue and come in parallel to it and segmentation of passengers focusing on schools focusing on upmarket tourist trips focusing on passengers with higher willingness to pay but i think that the real point that we really hope to see more of are hybrid services services where the paratransit sector works effectively with the formal sector and here we're seeing a lot of innovation happening in south africa in particular Let's look at the market forces. We are a continent of massively increasing population. On the left side, I show a graph in which I chose some cities that might not be uh, <clears throat> known to all of us, Ibadan, Kano, these are secondary cities in Nigeria, but they and a lot of others will cross the 5 million mark in just 10 years time. So we have this massive urbanization, a rising middle class, which is suffering massively because of the COVID-19 crisis. And a lot of them, have to change their travel patterns accordingly but in general the long-term trend is a massive increase in trips taken in the two million citizen suburb of cairo 6th of october we're working on a sump 
sustainable mobility plan. We envisioned how will travel demand change in 10 years' time, and we identified it will increase by almost 90%. Even in the most sustainable scenario we can imagine shown here, we can see that formal public transport will increase by 12x, by 1,200%, but still, paratransit will cover the lion's market share. And this is a study that we'll be publishing shortly. If we look at other studies, Africa Policy is an Africa-wide project made by the OECD, studied the geography of the continent, identified a lot of clusters of urban agglomeration and this massive urban growth of these cities. The image on the left, on the right side, is from Africa Cities, a World Bank report in 2015 in partner with UN Habitat, amongst others. And it shows that cities are crowded, disconnected, and continuing to grow horizontally. In other words, as urbanization takes place in Africa, travel demand increases faster than population growth, as more people need to use motorized transport for longer distances, and with rising incomes, simply have to travel more. And this is where we're seeing traditional service provision paradigms really evolving. Paratransit is hard work, but it can pay. We've seen this trend in Egypt, in Uganda, or every context we've worked with. It always attracts unskilled entrants into the labor market, often as their first job. If you are a migrant to Kampala, your easiest first job is to rent a boda boda and start operating it on a day-by-day -day landlord model. We're seeing a process of financialization financial actors bringing informal or formal sources of capital to give loans, essentially giving the Boda Boda drivers not just the operational commercial risk they normally carry, but also the financial risk of the vehicle they operate. And this is for the Boda Bodas, but also for the microbuses and all sectors of paratransit. And there is a cottage industry growing as these new providers come in. In Egypt, we have Uber contracting drivers or offering drivers access to the platform to offer ride hailing services. But there is a cottage industry of middlemen that appear and that really start littering the value chain. This image on the right side just shows all of the different companies, and this is, goes to 40, 50 others, that provide onboarding services to Uber's platform, vehicles, and practically accounts so that you can start operating right away. We've seen that access to capital remains low. We've asked drivers in a survey that we did three months ago during COVID-19, and they <clears throat> still don't manage to get enough capital to operate the service that they want. And this highly fragmented industry, highly dispersed as it is, leads to massive on-street competition. We've seen in main corridors up to 60 services competing with different A's and B's, points and N's. Yet, we've also seen signs of massive unmet demand at areas outside of the major transport terminals. So typically, the limited amount of capital immediately gets driven to the main terminals to start operating all of these myriad of point-to-point -point services. And it's a highly fragmented industry. If we look at each vehicles, often cost a third of the cost of Japanese vehicles. Like we're talking about the King On and Great Wall microbuses compared to the Toyota Hiaces at the same capacity. And yet, there is an overwhelming favoring of even a 20 or 30 year old Toyota vehicle. And the vehicle rent on average is 36% of the total daily income that you can hope for as a driver. And this still shows that the cost of capital is very high. Finally, there is the regulatory evolution, and this will actually have its entire next webinar, so I will not talk about it today. But this is really important to remember that the rules of the game are changing for everybody. So let's get to COVID. How did it change? We've seen the Google Mobility data quoted multiple times today, and the message is one like travel demand really went to less than half in all of the markets because of the stay-at-home guidance. And it's recovering, but not fully. However, what we're seeing is that paratransit is less affected than formal modes of transport. We can see this geographically as to the areas where people 
uh, where travel has recovered faster, where congestion has returned faster. And we've also seen it in talking to the drivers. In the survey we did, COVID wasn't really an issue. People were operating. Because a lot of the drivers also simply opted not to start operating because drivers are prosumers, they're professional consumers. They're feared for their own safety and thus follow the stay at home guidance themselves, lowering supply. We've seen a number of public measures, we've talked about them, environmental hygiene measures, social distancing measures, some economic support. In Egypt, there was no economic support that we are aware of directed towards the transportation sector. There has been a 500 different pounds, it's like 30 US dollars stipend for three months that has been paid between April and June. And it's for all irregular workers. So we believe that some informal paratransit workers qualified for it. However, what we've seen and what I want to mention is the Cairo Transport Authority. It's an operator, but also a regulator. And it basically cannibalized the sector in early because they payment from the 28 companies that are operating under concession the moment that the crisis hit because they saw their own balance sheet and their own income streams getting hit madly and in the lack of government support we had this massive process of confusion in the sector now these conflicting messages i'm from not sorry to interrupt you i'm just reminding you of the time real quick because i have a lot of questions coming in so we want to uh allow them to ask you so just a remark on the time huh? i'll take this as good news i'll finish in a moment uh, marwan thank, thank you. you in uganda we've seen the same conflicting messages paratransit took their own measures here is a tank where passengers can clean their hand coming in there is a complete ban you can see the old taxi park completely deserted and there was a ban on the boda bodas operating in downtown that outlawed up to 44 percent of all trips but it didn't last, it lasted for one month. So coming back to the key trends, what we're seeing is that the trips taken will probably stay the same, urbanization probably stay the same, financialization and new entrants are the real question marks because these will change the industry. We believe that COVID-19 will lead to a faster consolidation that was already happening. Chinese vehicles will continue changing and appending the business models. And we think that new business model will just accelerate because of the shock that took place. And this takes me to my final slide, which is our vision for evolving the sector. It's really two statements. There is no working without the transport workers themselves. And in context and context where we've worked, we've seen a high willingness to engage and to work towards sustainable goals. And the other is there is no deep decarbonization without working with the sector. Even in this forecast I talked about earlier on 6th of October, 10 years from now, best case scenario, all massive public transport will be built, monorails uh, and a commuter rail will still have more than half of service provision will remain paratransit. In Cairo, we did a back of the envelope calculation, replacing all the microbuses with the top end Toyota Hiaces that are so favorite, air conditioning and everything costs less than just 17 kilometers of the Cairo Metro or the phase currently under construction. And this is what we really hope to promote, working with the sector, achieve our goals, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, for your beautiful and nice, very interesting presentation. Sorry I had to cut you off, so I will also keep it very short and ask you one question uh, for the rest of the audience also who managed to not receive an answer for their question. I really apologize for that, forgive me, but we are running out of time. So please, if you have an answer that you want to ask the speakers, please get in touch with us directly, send us an email, and we will try and make sure to answer that. So for you, Mohammed, one question is, uh, and this is regarding the Chinese vehicles that you mentioned, uh, the question is from Nathaniel Tan. Is it, known, it is known that the Chinese vehicles have a lower capital cost, but they do have a higher maintenance running cost. Does this impact uh, informal PTOs in the region? This is exactly it. It really depends on the market. In Egypt, we're seeing an influx simply because there aren't enough Toyota vehicles to go around, and the new vehicles are really up market. But if you can get your hand on an old Toyota Hiace, they just keep on going. There is already an established supply chain to just 
uh, keep on upgrading and renovating the equipment that over the total cost of ownership of the vehicle, it is more effective than the lower capital cost Chinese vehicles. Mm -hmm. And we see this, for instance, in how operators choose to allocate which vehicle to which route. The really high yield, like high pressure, the routes where the fill and go system fills in 60 seconds, they remain with the old school Toyota vehicles. And the Chinese vehicles are really relegated to maybe longer distance routes uh, where you spend more time waiting to fill the vehicle before driving. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. I think this answers the question. Uh, um, okay, not to withhold much time. Thank you, Mohammed, for the beautiful and nice presentation. Um, I will now move on to uh, our next speaker. I do not think that Mr. Prasanna Patwardhan will attend today. Unfortunately, he apologized. So I will now welcome uh, Mrs. Fatima Arroyo Arroyo from uh, the World Bank, from the Sub Saharan. African Transport uh, Program, and, and uh, she is a senior urban transport specialist. I hand the floor to you, Ms. Fatima. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to confirm, can you can you hear me uh, now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Fatima. But unfortunately, now we cannot. <laughs> there seems to be a connection problem. Ms. Fatima, if you can hear us, will you please try and reconnect? Okay, I think um, until uh, Ms. Fatima is back with us, Ms. Fatima, I can see you moving, but uh... Uh, hello, yes. can you hear me? Yes, now it's perfect. Now it's perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm sharing now my screen. So. Um, uh, I would like first to thank uh, UITP for the organization of this webinar in partnership with SSATP um, and uh, we look forward from SSATP and from the World Bank to, to continue with this partnership in future webinars and, and other activities. Uh, so I'm going to do a very brief presentation. I, I'm aware of the time that the session is supposed to finish at 2.30 so I'm going to try to be uh, very quick in this presentation uh, where I'm going to uh, give a brief presentation about uh, some activities that the World Bank have been doing uh, to assess the impact of COVID in urban mobility in Africa and uh, presenting very briefly um, a policy note that uh, um, we are actually uh, sharing as a, a handout in this um, in this webinar, you can find it attached uh, uh, in uh, in in the in this event, and we will be also sharing this this policy note after the the webinar. So three elements in the presentation today. First, a brief introduction after um, a presentation about the impacts of urban transport in Africa, cities and initial response due to COVID. To have an overall uh, picture, we have having like individual presentation from different speakers from Senegal, uh, Cairo and, and Turkey. Uh, we are going to give like more like an overall picture about what's happening in, in Africa. And uh, finally, a series of recommendations and conclusions uh, towards the future in, in Africa. Um, so the World Bank has projected the first recession, recession in Africa in 25 years. Uh, this is um, uh, the projection actually it is that the Afri African econ economy will contract between uh, 2, 5, 2.5, 2, uh, 2 2.1 and and 5% in, in 2020. And public transport has been among the, the highest hit sectors as a result of the lockdowns, the physical distancing measure and behavioral changes. And actually the, uh, uh, the policy approach have, has differed a lot in different African countries. Uh, we saw a, 
in, in average, an important decrease of the numbers of trees by public transport, as we can see in the graph on, on, on the left. Uh, however, there are some countries that have been much more restrictive, as, as uh, South Africa or Zimbabwe, um, and other where they put in place much of measures such as Tanzania or, or Zambia. And up today, uh, some of the countries are kind of like back back to normal in terms of number of trees, but others, such as, for example, uh, Zimbabwe uh, and, and, and South Africa, there is still very much low in the terms of ter in terms of number of trees by public transport. And what we have seen also it is that the numbers of trips uh, are very much uh, uh, correlated to the change of policies. We can see on the right a graph where we show uh, then the trips to uh, works, uh, residential trips and, and transit stations uh, in specifically in, in Ghana, in Kumasi and, and Accra. And we see actually that um, uh, uh, we, have, we, see, we see clear changes in, in trips uh, at the beginning of this restriction, when there was the full lockdown, and once the the, the lockdown was was lifted, um, so under this context, in uh, between the months of April and June, uh, a team at the World Bank and SSATP, we did a survey uh, in in a, a diverse group of African cities uh, to assess what has been the impact of COVID in public transport, what were the, these initial responses that cities were putting in place, and also to inform a series of recommendations uh, towards uh, towards the, the recovery of COVID. Um, and there were some guiding questions in our, in our uh, this analytical assessment on, on the situation. And some were more in the short term. Uh, for example, a key question, it was what mechanism could, could help to reconcile uh, the policies on, on physical distancing and also with the fin financial sustainability on public transport. More in the medium term, how can government support these post-crisis recovery plans for public transport sector? And more in the long term, actually, what are the, the overall trends and, and how mobility uh, changes will influence the future of urban design and transport model shares? So, um, passing to the second point of the presentation of the impacts on urban transport and initial responses. So, what we saw um, in general it is that Africans have cities have, have acted uh, promptly to protect the peoples from uh, spreading the, the COVID-19. Uh, we saw that most of the cities uh, uh, enforce or put some kind of regulations to use face masks in, in public transport. Uh, they put in place other series of preventive measures like hand cleaning, uh, cleaning vehicles and, and stations. Um, and uh, um, and, and uh, in some specific cities also there was a specific focus in protecting uh, the workers in the sector, the, such as uh, um, drivers and, and conductors. Um, we also saw, and I, I thought it was something very interesting, that some of the countries that were particularly uh, impacted by, by Ebola a few years back were some of the ones that were fastest to respond to mobilize uh, uh, local communities uh, actually and then to, to create this awareness about the issues of COVID, um, such as the case of Sierra Leone and Liberia. And then in terms of like the implementation of these initial measures that countries put in place, uh, we saw a clear um, uh, concern from cities in terms of how uh, there has been some challenge in the implementation of the formal sectors due to the nature of the sector uh, uh, and where it's more difficult at the end to, uh, uh, to, to control the, the 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 implementation of of of, uh, of different measures. Uh, so what we have seen in general in the whole continent it is that there has been a serious financial stress both for uh, um, for formal and informal sector, uh, some of the cities that estimate a, a loss of revenue between uh, 50 and, and 70 percent during uh, during some months. Um, we have seen also in many cities uh, there has uh, uh, started a discussion or approve a, a renegotiation of, of fares. Cities such as uh, Addis, Dakar, uh, Kumasi, Nairobi, etc. And uh, in some of the cases, there has been uh, financial support provided uh, to operators, such as the case of Maputo, for example, where government provided support through uh, funding um, 
uh, fuel for operators uh, on the formal sector on the car that uh, 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 our colleague uh, has presented uh, previously. Um, on the informal sector, what we have seen it is that uh, COVID has exacerbated the vulnerability of the transport sector workers that were already very, very, very vulnerable groups uh, before, uh, and there has been hit both from the financial side and on the on the health side, and there there tend to be workers that uh, do not have um, uh, any kind of coverage, safety net or health insurance coverage uh, to protect them from, from this health uh, uh, crisis. Um, on the formal operators, the the, the cases are more limited cases in, in the African continents. We have also seen that the fact that they have like more significant fixed costs and less flexibility than minibuses, or minibuses owners to adapt to the changes in, in demand, also that can cause important uh, financial stress uh, for their operation. Um, so, uh, so as, as I mentioned before, we have seen actually that this short-term emergency response in African cities has been probed and it has been uh, relatively effective. Uh, what we are um, uh, what we have seen is actually a lack of more like medium and long-term measures uh, uh, for the transport sector. And, and as we see, COVID is really is, is, is generating a disruption in the sector. And actually this disruption uh, can be uh, seen and actually as also an opportunity to rethink the sector and then to, uh, to promote some of these reforms that uh, cities has been discussing uh, for a while. Um, in general, there are, there are really few exceptions where uh, we have seen that COVID has been uh, really uh, promoting more like medium or long-term thinking uh, towards uh, changes in, in the sector and improvements in the sector. There are some few exceptions, some cities that are providing uh, financial support to operators, um, some cities, for example, Addis that had implemented some pilot solutions to, to enhance uh, uh, bicycling, and uh, we see uh, some cities also that actually have accelerated the use of digital application, especially for cash payment, for example, in Kenya, some interesting solutions also in South Africa, Freetown and, and Harare. Um, uh, but the, the response to COVID, uh, both in the short term and also in the medium terms, is challenged by this, the, the, the informality in, in the sector, no? that actually the fact that there is this atomization of informal operator make difficult actually to reach them in, in, a, in a quick manner um, uh, to, uh, to provide support. There is also in many places a lack of political will to create a subsidy, subsidy mechanism for informal sector and also um, in many cases, there are a lack of the already defined uh, financial uh, instruments uh, to, to transfer in subsidies to the informal operators. Um, so, uh, under this, this initial assessment that we did, uh, uh, we prepared a series of recommendations based on, on three levels, short, medium and, term, uh, and long term, that as I mentioned uh, are summarized uh, in a policy note that you will be uh, getting soon. So the first uh, uh, area of, of, uh, of measures is more in the short term. Uh, it is very important to continue with the series of, of uh, of uh, measures uh, in the medium term uh, to um, uh, in the medium term uh, in the in the short term to 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 enhance and, and to continue this this uh, the prevention of of a spread in public transport uh, through all the health measures. Uh, wearing masks, uh, uh, the measures linked to uh, to hand washing. Uh, um, awareness creation in, in public transport, etc. Uh, second, it's also important to to deepen the the, um, the financial support to uh, informal operators under certain conditions. And that actually this is linked to more like medium and long term plans to uh, to deepen the sector reforms uh, and the professionalization on on public transport. Um, and uh, at a third point that we think is very important is to build up the confidence in public transport that has been actually uh, been lost in many cases. Um, there is an actual issue on acceptability um, on the use of, of public transport. Um, more in, towards the medium term, 
Uh, we also see that it's very important to define more sustainable financing mechanism, thinking, for example, on how to use a percentage of, of fuel um, uh, of fuel taxes or, or vehicle registration fees uh, towards uh, public transport. We see also important to continue with this proce process of formalization and then to put in place a series of um, uh, transport demand management and transport management measures to enhance public transport operation and also to uh, uh, to, to make COVID has in a way reminded us something that we already knew that towards the long term uh, public transport is going to be essential for cities inclusion competitiveness and uh, um, and the, the long-term objectives uh, should be very linked to these uh, um, objectives of of uh, um, of enhancing public transport and non-motorized transport in, in the cities where we work so i think with this um i will uh, i will finish so uh, you know we will be very Welcome to to hear any comment or questions about this this policy recommendation and this policy note that that we uh, we have prepared. So, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Fatima, for uh, your excellent presentation. Uh, very informative, and um, yeah, like you pointed out, uh, the so the policy note just for the audience to know is also available. If you check on the screen, you'll find the handouts tab. Just click on it and you can download the uh, PDF version for your review. So that's very important. Um, and I apologize again for running out of time a bit, but I think I have one question before concluding. And after that, I will kindly ask our speakers to open the webcam for a, a final group photo slash screenshot. Um, so maybe, yeah, the question to you, Ms. Fatima, is... Uh, yeah, so you were talking about the vulnerability of the sector. Can you tell us more about the signs that the vulnerability uh, show? What, what are the signs that this vulnerability show in the sector? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think that the vulnerabilities often uh, uh, you know, have like many dimensions, but one key one it is related to uh, uh, to to the poverty, to poverty, and also to the cap capacity uh, in a way to respond to to shocks. Uh, and what we see in particular in the informal sector in Africa, it is that um, the sector is uh, mainly, I mean, the 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 risk of the man is mainly taken uh, by uh, drivers uh, and and conductors, um, and they are in general a very very uh, poor and, and, and low-income uh, group. Uh, so it's in, in under these current circumstances, actually it's a group that depends uh, literally of the daily income they get to buy food and to feed their families. And this is something that there has been uh, struggling uh, in the last in the last uh, uh, in the last month since since COVID uh, started. So this is something that um, COVID has even more exacerbated their, their daily income that they really need for uh, the, their very, very much uh, basic uh, needs. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fatima. Uh, I think, yeah, that was the question for that. I have, um, yeah, Emmanuel, I, I don't know if you want me to I think we're out of time, so I will just uh, tell the audience that we have, um, yeah, there are a lot of questions that are asking me about the, the representation from India. So unfortunately, um, uh, he could not be with us, uh, Mr. Prasanan, because he had an emergency. But hopefully in the uh, next webinars, we will have uh, more representation also from Latin America as well. For Mr. Prasanan, I think we could try and provide a, provi a, a recorded interview um yeah and i think maybe for the speak I, I think yeah there's no more time to answer the questions so if again you have uh, uh questions that are left unanswered please get in touch with us maybe for the speakers if you're still there uh open your webcams we'd like to take a really quick screenshot a quick photo usually this would be 
easier in person, but we can try and make this happen electronically. Uh, Emmanuel, are you also there with us? And Arthur, Arthur Comier from Brussels HQ. I'd like to thank him as well for his efforts. Great, maybe change the slide to the first page. Let's see if this works out. That's great. Uh, Marwan, can I say just uh, a few words at the end, a closing remark, if, if you don't of mind? Of course. Of course. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, organizing this uh, this webinar and, and uh, I think we, we had a very interesting presentations um, as far as the CCTP and uh, Fatima had the chance to present the, the, the work we've done on the impact of COVID on, uh, on public transport. Uh, I think we can come with um, from what I see um, a few lessons uh, I would say um, uh, about the the informal sector, um, I think it, it proved very challenging to protect the the operators and users from the negative impact of COVID crisis. Uh, uh, that that's what came out of the survey we did in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's for two reasons. Uh, uh, informal sector had less incentive. To, to implement protective measures. Uh, all cities with formal public transport systems such as Zaradis, uh, Dakar, Abidjan, Cape uh, Town, Maputo, um, had re relatively uh, easy manner to follow the basic hygiene and physical distancing practices for protecting drivers and, and, and the riders. The implementation of these preventive measures by the informal operators um, has varied across the African cities and, and proved challenging to monitor and qualify and quantify as well. This situation has put the, the health of uh, many vulnerable uh, bus operators uh, and users at risk. So, so that's the first lesson. The second one is the targeting you know, of the financial support. I think we, we heard it across the presentation from Turkey, uh, Senegal, uh, Cairo. Um, I mean, government, whenever there is a will, uh, and I think we, we, uh, that was evidenced by, by Turkey, uh, where this COVID crisis uh, uh, pushed government to uh, agree and change the law to provide subsidies at the municipal level, at the local level. And yet, it, it was not really easy to do for, for two reasons. First of all, is, is the, the, the numbers of uh, the informal sector. As you may know, one of the results of the opening this to the informal sector is the overcapacity, uh, oversupply of bus operators. It's extremely difficult to uh, target uh, any financial support or subsidies in cases like this. Um, and, and this, uh, you know, uh, compared to the formal sector, which was relatively easy uh, to, to, to target this financial support. So this, uh, again, has penalized most disadvantaged and captive uh, bus uh, users. In some instance, um, I think we were pushed or to accept an increase in in in, uh, uh, in, in fares uh, instead of subsidies, which which had a really a negative impact on the users. So all in all, I mean, these lessons uh, push us to really take this reform uh, agenda very seriously. Uh, and I think we heard it from Cairo, the, the, the presentation from Cairo, where there is some hope. Um, and, and we'd like to hear a little bit more uh, about these uh, initiatives. Uh, I think Mohammed Ngazi uh, is working on a survey and, and he promised to come back to us 
to let us know about this uh, change in the regulatory landscape. So we'd like to hear a little bit more. We heard from uh, Turkey about this initiative to uh, move from net cost to gross cost uh, contract where, where the, the, the emphasis and the focus would be put more on the quality of the service. Uh, I think that really uh, provides a good introduction to the next uh, webinar. Uh, so I'm really uh, looking forward to uh, collaborating uh, more with uh, uh, UITP uh, uh, and see if we can uh, advance this uh, challenging agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mustafa. Thank you for your uh, nice words. I think I will also allow the other speakers to have also concluding remarks. Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Mr. Faizula, if you would like to say something. Uh, hello again. I think uh, everything uh, we have we have told, I think, too much and we have run out of time. So maybe uh, next time, as Mr. Mustafa said, we are going to talk about the governance uh, of the informal sector. At that time, uh, it is uh, more important topics. This is effect of the COVID important, but the more important topics how to formalize and governance of the informal sectors. So uh, I would like to thank all of the uh, attendees and uh, colleagues around the world to share their experience. Uh, and hope to see, see them again in our uh, next uh, webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Faizula. Uh, just quickly, before you close, don't close yet. Uh, I will ask each speaker, because we also have Jaspal with us, uh, really quickly before we finish. Um, um, Ms. Mr. Uh, Tierno, do you have uh, any last concluding remarks? We cannot hear you. Please unmute un your mic. Sorry. Well, thank you very much. I was very happy to share this uh, webinar with a colleague coming from Turkey and uh, uh, from uh, uh, all other countries in uh, Africa. And uh, uh, I think so that uh, we have to focus on how uh, finance. Uh, public transport uh, in the context of uh, uh, coronavirus. Uh, this is the We lost question. your voice, Mr. Chairman, uh, sorry. Hello? Hello? Marwan? Marwan? I think uh, I think Marwan has some Hello, Marwan. issues actually. Yeah, I can hear you, me, but uh, maybe it's you, Marwan, that has issues. Marwan. Hello, Marwan. We can hear you, Mr. Tierno. Hello, Marwan. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. He's gone, Mr. Tierno. We can hear you. You can hear me. Yes. Emmanuel? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just I would like to, to thank everyone, uh colleague coming from Turkey and uh, Cairo and all other countries in Africa. Uh I just wanna conclude that we have to uh, take account of the financement of uh, public transportation in the in this context uh called uh, we have a uh, uh, negative signal for the uh, for informal and formal sector and that uh, I think that we have to to think uh, the culture around to either uh, environment and uh, also digitalization but uh, in the center of this reflection we have to uh, to see how to build a uh, a sustainable public transportation with other uh, innovation uh, to take take account in finance. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Tiano. And uh, sorry, I think my my laptop is getting overheated and freezing all the time. So the technical issues from my side. Um, Hegezi, Mr. Mohammed Hegezi, last words. Well, uh, I would first like to thank the UITT for inviting us all here today to listen to each other and to be able to present our research findings. And for me, I think that I couldn't agree more with the last sentence on Mrs. Fatima's uh, presentation, which is that we still lack a mechanism to effectively channel subsidies to the sector, because this is uh, what we really see an opportunity starting to open up. We're seeing this massive private sector dynamism come in, startups entering the sector, consolidating, organizing. And while they are still more upmarket, more profit seeking, what we ask ourselves is how can we leverage the same power, the same technology, the same dynamism to solve that policy problem of consolidating the sector, formalizing it, and effectively being able to channel resources into its capitalization and operation costs. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Very strong words. Uh, Ms. Fatima, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, so I think that uh, on, on my side, uh, it has been a fantastic uh, um, um, knowledge sharing experience. Uh, hearing from from people, from different people from different countries, I think is is definitely uh, uh, something that uh, I think enrich uh, the conversation. And hearing this voice from the ground, I think is extremely important. So I think hearing the the situation in and the experience in Dakar, in in Egypt, in in Turkey, uh, I think is is essential actually to really. Uh, uh, been able to provide solutions that are very well adapted to each each of, each of the countries. I also think that there is um, um, uh, there is a, there is important opportunities to uh, rethink the, the sector, to uh, um, to aim for a formalization, to aim for changes in the use of technologies in the sector that COVID might be able to. Uh, to accelerate, but these the government also need to play a role, role on incentivizing incentivizing certain uh, uh, solutions. So I think that there is a role for the private sector, there is a role for government, and there is a role also for institution as UITP, the World Bank, also to uh, uh, to help to uh, to move the, all these all these uh, reforms and and improvements in the sector. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Ms. Fatima. Really looking forward to the next webinars and maybe to the UITP team uh, led by uh, Do Emmanuel Domarguez, uh, our Transport Authorities Manager. One last word. Which is just to say, really happy uh, to have uh, this uh, high level uh, members of uh, the panel to, to, to have taken part and share their experience with, uh, with us. Thank you very much. Uh, also very happy to have uh, seen the uh, active participation of uh, uh, the uh, the audience of the the participants of uh, of uh, listeners. Uh, so uh, we have not managed to answer all the questions today, partly because uh, well, mostly because most of the questions will be dealt with in the coming webinars. So um, really, uh, stay tuned, stay connected, and. Um, just wondering eventually if uh, Jaspal would be around and whether Jaspal you'd like to say maybe one or two words before we leave the floor to uh, Arthur to come to the end of this webinar. Jaspal, are you around? I think he, he texted. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Okay. Thank you, Marwan. Uh, so yeah, I, I think we are running out of time and uh, the the best principle is that we should leave the floor before the audience leave us. So I'll, I'll be very quick. <laughs> And uh, I think it was a great uh, webinar discussing about the current challenge we are facing with COVID and what is, uh, you know, what is the, the way forward. And I think the next two webinars will be more critical because there we are going to uh, tackle the issue of governance and regulation. And that's what we discover in today's webinar also that the key challenge is from the regulation side and the governance side. And that's we are seeing the changes will happen. And the second, uh, the third webinar will be talking about the technology, how we can leverage technology to to push this sector, because we are seeing a lot of digital transformation and part of uh, the world in different sector. And I think informal sector should also experience more digital transformation in coming days. So great work by the team. Thank you so much. Looking forward to attend the, you know, the upcoming webinars. 
thank you just well arthur yes uh just for your information we will share the recording uh soon as well as a small analysis of what was said during the webinar and uh Stay tuned for the two following webinars on 21st of September at 4 uh, p.m. Brussels time and on uh, 19th of October, uh, 2 p.m. on Brussels time. Have a nice day, all. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.